Hello everyone. Today I want to expand on something I hinted at in a previous video of mine and address the lobster in the room. Dr. Jordan Peterson. Most people on YouTube probably know who he is by now, but in case you don't, I will give you a short overview. Jordan Peterson is a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto and rose to stardom not that long ago by misrepresenting the act to amend the Canadian Human Rights Act and criminal code also known as Bill C-16. For this he was rewarded with a lot of attention and since then has been fetishized as some kind of free speech martyr for standing up to the Canadian government who wanted to open the gulags to people accidentally misgendering a person. If they find me I won't pay it. If they put me in jail I'll go on a hunger strike. I'm not doing this. And that's that. With his recent best-selling book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, he's also become the savior of disaffected young males with messy rooms. His main work, however, are his lectures, all of which can be found online and have now also gathered a significant fan base. There's one thing that stands out when talking about Jordan Peterson's fan base and that sometimes earns him some uncomfortable questions. Maximox says, thoughts on the Jews? <laughs> Thoughts on the Jews? Well, the first thing I could say about Jews is that a lot of my friends are happen to be Jewish and... Okay, all right, what the hell? Address the Jewish question. That's a hell of a thing to ask. Could Jewish individuals use their position of power to seek out revenge against places like Europe and Russia that have a history of expelling okay, Jews? hold it, hold it, hold it. <laughs> Namely that he seems to attract a lot of people from the fringes of the right, although he is very opposed to the political views of said fringes. His, let's say, more moderate fan base seems to have no answer for why that is, and often claims that if anything, Peterson has a moderating effect on people with extremist views, pulling them more to the center. There is a very popular clip making the rounds, which has gathered around 2.3 million views by now, and is titled, How Hitler Was Even More Evil Than You Think. Although I would assume Peterson would probably object to this title because his big thing is that given the right circumstances, anyone can be a Nazi prison guard. A very revolutionary idea, by the way, that people are shaped by their surroundings. Anyway, the clip is taken from a longer lecture called Maps of Meaning 11, The Flood and the Tower, which I will leave in the description so you can make sure I'm not taking him out of context. In this lecture, he tackles the Nazis' motivation for the Holocaust and gives his own perspective on the matter. It is unfortunate that as with so many, many things he says, his own lack of knowledge leads to his points being garbled at best and wrong at worst. Not only is he completely wrong historically speaking and puts into question if his knowledge of Nazi ideology exceeds Hitler's table talk and ordinary men, but the way he frames Hitler's or the Nazis' motivations showcases why the far right finds him so appealing. He doesn't make any excuses or portrays them positively in any way, but what his take and his other work implies fits very well with what the far right thinks. So we'll look at how he is wrong from a historical perspective and why his conclusion is actually dangerous. Let's listen to the clip, shall we? So here's what you should have done if you were a Nazi and you wanted to win the war. You should have enslaved the Jews and the gypsies and had them work, right? You had the, should have had them work for the benefit of the victory. And then if you wanted to, you liquidate them afterwards. That's the logical thing to do if you want to win. And we assume that Hitler wanted to win. But that's not a very intelligent assumption. Why would you assume that? He wasn't exactly a good guy. So why should we assume that he was aiming at the good that he was promoting, even in his own terms, right? The glorious, everlasting Fourth, Third Reich. So what do you do with the Jews and the gypsies? Well, round them up, fine. Enslave them, fine. You don't kill them. You certainly don't devote a substantial proportion of your war resources while you're losing to accelerate the rate at which the extermination is taking place. Because that's a bit counterproductive, unless what you're aiming at is the maximum possible mayhem in the shortest period of time. There's a whole lot to unpack just within this short statement. There is the fact that Peterson doesn't seem really sure if it's the Nazis' third or the imagined by neo-Nazis fourth Reich he's talking about. There is the issue that calling the Roma, Sinti and others persecuted under the label gypsies, a term which reproduces questionable language used by the perpetrators of the Holocaust. But the foremost problem is that Peterson doesn't seem to take his own advice seriously. Now, you know, you have to use that dictum carefully. Later in the video, he cites Jung, of course, to make the point that sometimes in order to infer the motivations for an action, one needs to look at the outcome of an action. You can suspend your unnecessary demolition of people, win the damn war, and then pick it up afterwards, or while you're losing, you can just accelerate the mayhem even though it's counterproductive. It's like, what'd they pick? Well, they pick to accelerate the mayhem. And so to me, there's an old psychoanalytic idea. I think this was derived by Jung. 
you can't figure out what someone is doing or why, look at the outcome and infer the motivation. That's not really what historians investigating the Nazis and the Third Reich, or any period for that matter, do. Not just because not every action might produce the outcome desired by the historical actor, but also because, and this is something where Peterson should probably have listened to some postmodern theorists if he had read them, presents the massive danger of projecting your own cultural and social assumptions and rationalities back onto historical actors, who due to difference in historically formed discourse might operate under entirely different assumptions and rationalities. Case in point, Jordan Peterson asserts that in order to win the war, it would have been more beneficial to round up and enslave Jews and so-called gypsies rather than to kill them. This represents a fairly abhorrent application of capitalist logic of valorization and exploitation. Under the base assumptions our society and the society Jordan Peterson operates under, the mass enslavement and economic exploitation of millions of people represents an understandable, a logical policy. Leaving aside for now that the Nazis did exactly that in addition to mass murder, the problem begins when Peterson juxtaposes this supposedly fine logic with what he asserts the Nazis' real motif for their actions was. Mayhem and getting into the metaphysical Jungian drivel, the mark of Cain. Or are we going to attribute to Hitler the highest possible motives? Say no, it's an archetypal manifestation of Cain. Now he's going to put up a front that says, well, I'm your savior. It's like, well, destructive people think that Cain is their savior. The reality is simpler yet more complicated at the same time. Rather than mayhem or any sort of metaphysical manifestation of evil, the Nazis are relatively straightforward in telling us their base assumptions upon which their actions and logic is based upon. It's not mayhem, but rather the idea that the prime objective is the removal, up to and including physical extermination of Jews and so-called gypsies from the world. Winning the war for the Nazi leadership in the German state at the time means achieving that goal. War, German military theorist Karl von Clausewitz wrote, is the extension of politics by other means. This dictum is as true for the Nazis as it is for virtually every other war of the 19th and 20th century. Nazi politics and ideology is built around one core assumption about the nature of society, the state and history. That all of history, including all social formations, are built around a biological conflict between races, with the most prominent actors on this stage being the German or Aryan race, which represents order, progress and civilization, and the alleged Jewish race, which represents chaos, decadence, decay and destruction. Since in the Nazi worldview all of history revolves around this conflict, so does necessarily the Second World War and the conception of what a German victory looks like in this conflict. Even with the war itself becoming an important catalyst in radicalizing German policy, from discrimination, forced immigration and ghettoization to actual physical extermination of Jews. In his book The Origins of the Final Solution, Christopher Browning writes about the important changes that came with the start of the war in 1939 that not only forced the Nazis to consider what they called the Jewish question in a framework beyond Germany, it also represented a qualitative change. Germany was now at war. For some time, Nazi propaganda had branded the Jew as the enemy of Germany. If war came, it would be through the machinations of international Jewry. The Jew was an integral part, indeed the quintessence of the Nazi Feindbild, or stereotyped image of the enemy. Now that Germany was at war, harsh measures against the enemy, including potential enemies, non-combatant civilians, women, children, seemed self-evident and justified by national interest. We don't even have to look far to get this information straight from the horse's mouth. In a speech from January 13th, 1939, so more than half a year before the invasion of Poland, Hitler stated the following. Today I will once more be a prophet. If the international Jewish financiers in and outside Europe should succeed in plunging the nations once more into a world war, then the result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth and thus the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. Hitler would echo this prophecy several times in public, and after the US entered the conflict, propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels wrote in his diary, Regarding the Jewish question, the Führer is determined to clean the table. He prophesied that should the Jews once again bring about a world war, they would be annihilated. These were no empty words. The world war has come, therefore the annihilation of the Jews has to be its inevitable consequence. The question has to be examined without any sentimentality. We are not here to pity Jews, but to have pity for our own German people. If the German people have sacrificed about 160,000 dead in the battles in the East, the instigators of this bloody conflict will have to pay for it with their lives. But the war did even more than that. 
since in the view of Hitler and the German leadership, it represented the Manichaean struggle between the German and the Jewish race, it both necessitated every conceivable measure and made more radical policy possible. It is no coincidence that the order by which the T4 killing program aimed at murdering handicapped and mentally ill individuals in German hospitals and asylums was backdated by Hitler to September 1st, 1939, the day of the invasion of Poland. The purification of Germany, starting with the centralized murder of these unnütze Esser or not useful eaters, represented a first and necessary step at purifying the German race in a struggle with international Jewry, as represented by France, the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union alike. Which leads to another important point. It is also no coincidence that what we today consider the Holocaust, meaning the systematic state-sponsored genocide of so-called gypsies and Jews, started with the attack on the Soviet Union in 1941, in the form of the Nazi Einsatzgruppen starting to systematically shoot members of these groups behind the front line. The USSR, in the view of the Nazi leadership, was the physical and material manifestation of the danger of Jewish Bolshevism. Communism, according to Hitler and the German leadership, represented the Jews' most potent weapon in their historic struggle with the Germans. The idea of Judeo-Bolshevism had spread like wildfire from the outset of the Russian Civil War in 1917 and had become an integral part of extreme right-wing ideology in Germany during the German revolutions of 1918 and 1919. As Lorna Weddington writes in her book Hitler's Crusade, Bolshevism, the Jews and the Myth of Conspiracy, it was the juxtaposition of Asiatic Bolshevism with the Oriental Jew that provided the key to national socialist perceptions of an elaborate Jewish conspiracy, of which Marxism, with its insistence on eminently Jewish values, internationalism, egalitarianism and pacifism, so antithetical to the Völkisch ideal, was a key component. In short, the war against the Soviet Union was inextricably linked to the war against international Jewry. In fact, in the view of the German leadership of the Third Reich, they were one and the same. This is evident in how this war was planned and how the systematic murder of Jews in the Soviet Union was an integral element to its planning from the beginning. It was a war of extermination in which victory meant nothing short of the total physical and political annihilation of the Soviet Union and especially its Jewish population. In his study of Wehrmacht generals on the Eastern Front, Hitler's Heerführer, historian Johannes Hürter shows how deeply ingrained this idea of the war against the Soviet Union being a war of extermination against international Jewry was among the Wehrmacht leadership as well. For instance, the writings of General Hermann Hoth, who during and after the war constantly emphasized these factors by writing, among other things, that Stalin's Soviet Union was a Bolshevist, Asiatic and Jewified state that spread like an oil spill and like an oil spill needed to be contained. 1941 was the last possible point in time to stop the flood of Jewish Bolshevism at the borders of Europe. What all of this shows is that rather than some abstract form of mayhem, there was a concrete, discernible and explicit basic assumption about the world that dictated the Nazis' actions and logic of these actions. Victory in the war meant the annihilation of the Jews and so-called gypsies. This was the idea that both the Holocaust and the very nature of the war, how it was planned, organized and executed, was centered around. This is the reason why the Einsatzgruppen started off the systematic murder of Jews and so-called gypsies in the Soviet Union in 1941, why the death camps opened their doors in 1942, and why the German leadership started accelerating the program of genocide even in 1944. Because to them victory was impossible without genocide. It's also the reason why, based on this assumption, the Nazis did build a system that followed premises that Peterson calls logical and fine. The Nazis did enslave Jews and so-called gypsies and forced them to work in the German war machine. Millions of Jews and so-called gypsies worked for the IG Farben in Auschwitz, built V2 rocket sites and the rockets themselves, and manufactured goods for the Wehrmacht. Also, they expropriated assets from robbed art, houses and money to the sale of gold teeth, and even hair of murdered Jews netted the German Reich millions of Reichsmark that were invested in the war economy. Economist Zindai Zabludov writes that, in late 1930s prices, the value of Jewish assets amounted to 10 to 15 billion dollars. This estimate is based on a 1998 paper by this author. Its methodology draws on the pioneering efforts by Nehemia Robinson in the 1940s and 1950s and other material. This includes estimates of the Jewish share of wealth for each country in Nazi-occupied Europe, tax records, country estimates published at the time, and the asset declarations that the Nazis forced the Jews to file. In today's prices, today being 2005, the value of these Jewish assets would be some 143 to 215 billion dollars. The Holocaust, which the Nazis very much organized as a for-profit venture, contributed to said capacity. 
While taking up very little resources and manpower, the camps financed themselves and generated surplus profit, and even the killing campaign was organized in a way that provided what the Nazis perceived as economic benefits. Nowhere is this more evident than when it comes to food policy. Historian Christian Gerlach details this in his book Krieg, Ernährung, Völkermord, when he writes that under the impressions of the German experiences of the First World War, it was an absolute priority of the German leadership to have the German populace fed. They succeeded in this given that in the terms of calories, the German population was the second best fed one after the US Americans during the entire war. The way this was achieved ties in directly with the Holocaust and the program of economic exploitation. Not only did the Germans go as far as to cause a catastrophic famine in Greece, but one of the very motives why the extermination program sped up in 1942 with the Operation Reinhardt Death Camp starting to operate in Poland was that the Nazis wanted to save food. You don't have to feed dead people and to kill 1.9 million people you otherwise would have to feed no matter how bad it allowed the Reich leadership to keep rations comparatively high for the German population. And here's where we get to what I called dangerous conclusions earlier. The reason this is so important and why Jordan Peterson's musings on Nazism are so objectionable is rather simple. By understanding that the Nazis' actions followed a rationality derived from their basic assumptions about the world, we are able to grasp the destructive force of racist and anti-Semitic ideology, of a conspiratorial worldview that is centered around the charge of a group wishing to destroy our values, our way of life. By simply ascribing the Nazis' actions to a wish to cause mayhem to the mark of Cain, their actions are exterritorialized from history, excluded from the process of understanding them. If, as Peterson later posits in the video, the cruelties committed by the Nazi perpetrators are the result of evil or a psychopathology, they are excluded from any attempt to understand them as a manifestation of an ideology. We can never fully grasp psychopaths and by pathologizing the perpetrators of the Nazi genocide, we reassure ourselves that we can never become them. But Nazism was not a pathology, and it was not just the wish to cause mayhem. Nazis were the result of a concrete worldview. A worldview not too dissimilar to that Jordan Peterson and other figures the far-right flocks to are trying to peddle today. If, like Peterson, people perceive the world in a way that posits certain behaviors, attitude and social positions of certain people as primordial, like for instance Peterson claims in his book 12 Rules for Life in stating, culture is symbolically, archetypically, mythically male, chaos the unknown is symbolically associated with the feminine, and further asserts that there are certain groups that are trying to disrupt the natural order of things with a nefarious agenda. And the second thing it's an assault on is everything that's been established since the Enlightenment. Rationality, empiricism, science, everything. Clarity of mind, dialogue, um, the idea of the individual, all of that is is not only you see it's not only that it's up for grabs that's not the thing it's to be destroyed that's the goal even going as far as to claim this supposed group isn't even interested in talking to you you see and this isn't this isn't this is no aberration that these people don't engage in dialogue that it's no aberration it's built right into the philosophical system they regard the idea of the idea that if you're in one power group and I'm in another, the idea that we can step out of that group, engage in a dialogue, have our worlds meet, and produce some sort of... Uh, understanding of each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, some sort of negotiated understanding. No, that's part of your, your oppressive patriarchal game, that idea. That whole idea is part of your game. So if I even engage in the dialogue, I'm playing your game, you win. Then conditions brought about by social change, political unrest, or even war can quickly lead to a political program that, like the Nazis, asserts that the only solution to this problem is for these groups not to live in this world anymore and to use coercion to assert the natural state of things. That's it for today, folks. And just to make it clear here again, I don't think Jordan Peterson is a fascist or a Nazi or whatever, but that's irrelevant to this video anyway. If you notice a significant increase in the depth of historical research this time, that's no coincidence. The majority of the script was written as a guest episode in collaboration with Joe, a fellow German speaker and PhD candidate in history, who goes by the name Commie Space Invader on the internet. He spends a lot of his time answering questions and moderating the Ask Historian subreddit, which I mentioned in past videos. It's an education community currently with 750,000 subscribers where people can post their questions about history and have them answered by actual historians and experts in the subject. Sometimes you might even see me there asking or answering a question. 
So definitely check it out via the link in the description. And in the near future, Joe and I will also do a live stream together where we will answer your questions about Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, as well as fighting bad history on the internet. I'll announce that separately though when I know the final date. As always, a big thank you to my lovely patrons who help me pay for books, borrowing fees or access to certain studies, among other things. For a list of the used sources in this video, you can check the description. And with that, I hope to see you next time. Have a good one.